strategically for your social media. I'm Dante St. James. Um, you're coming to me from Facebook today, from LinkedIn, from YouTube, wherever you're coming in from. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this is an experimental first live stream of going this way. Um, you can interact through the different chat streams there. I may or may not be able to see those come through, but if they do come through, fantastic. I'll respond to them. If they don't, please don't think I'm ignoring you. I just I can't see them through uh, the platform that I'm using to do the live stream. Thank you again for joining me. Uh, what we're going to be looking at today is all about, I guess, the, the, the idea of getting more out of your social media by writing better content. Here, I'm Alex uh, Gedanik, uh, an author and musician who is actually very, very good at his social media. It says, persistence is probably the single most important skill that you'll need to make your business a success. And almost nothing will try you try will work on the very first attempt. And that's very key. Even when you try frameworks like these, even when you try things like this, that they, they're not going to necessarily work straight away. Uh, they may take a while. In my case, it took me about six months to get enough momentum where this really started to work, particularly on LinkedIn, but secondarily, yeah, a little bit on Facebook as well. What we're going to cover today is a thing called the creator funnel. And I'll tell you about that and how it works and what it means when it comes to uh, distributing your content in a better way and creating better quality content as well. When you look at how to create what I call hub content, so that's your main long format content you're mostly gonna push your social media towards. And then we'll look at creating endless content from five very big questions that I've uh, swiped from one of my favorite content creators who I think is an absolute genius. And then finally looking at deepening that relationship so you can go and take a the whole point is to, to get people off social media so you can have that conversation with them and perhaps convert them to a client or at least deepen the relationship a little bit more so that you can set yourself up to be a better service to them. <laughs> Excuse me. My name, as I said earlier, is Dante St. James. We've got lots of different uh, certifications, qualifications, and associations with different uh, organizations. Probably primary amongst those is with Business Station through the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program and the uh, Self Employment Services from Workforce Australia, also through Business Station. I form Startup Territory. I'm a Meta Certified Lead Trainer. There's only five of us in Australia. Um, I've worked as a Story Brand Guide, a Lean Startup Labs contributor, a Canva champion, and have worked as a trainer with Digital Springboard, a project of Google here in Australia. Enough of that though. What is the creator funnel? What does it happen to be? And what are we what are we primarily playing with here? The creator, you know you're a creator basically when you start posting on social media. That's when you know that you have um, you've been regularly putting effort into your content creation. When you've got that uh, effort in your content creation, it means then you've got this ability to be able to reach people in a different way than just say posting stuff happens to be. Now, a content creator doesn't necessarily have to uh, be someone who, I suppose, creates um, video content. These days, a, a content creator is someone who's usually tied up with the idea that they uh, make TikTok videos or make YouTube videos, but that's not necessarily the right thing. It's not necessarily the, um, the right way of describing it. The right way of describing it would actually be that you would be um, – you would be putting yourself in as, as, as someone who's creating something that takes a little bit more thought than just taking a photo of your latte at the cafe or your eggs Benedict that you had at the cafe this morning. So just making sure that you've got that ability and that, that, that ability to be able to go a little bit further than just simply creating posts, you're creating some regular effort into your content creation. Now, first, a few stats here. Now, these may have changed a bit more recently, but this, these give you an indication of the different kind of usage of the different social media platforms. Of all the people who are on Facebook, about 57% of them, so just the, slightly the majority, uh, are posting and regularly contributing to the platform. So that's not something which you can say is uh, very common across all platforms because as we jump across to Instagram, um, notoriously, uh, I guess, a place where you go to look at things, uh, it's only 42%. So only 42% are regularly contributing uh, by posting stuff. So when I say contributing, I'm talking about people who post stuff to the, um, to, to the feed. They don't just uh, interact on the feed. They don't just 
answer comments. They don't just uh, like things or read things. They're actually producing their own posts as well. So it's a very big difference between Facebook and Instagram. That becomes an even bigger difference when you go to something like TikTok, where only about 5% of users of their billion users or so are actually posting anything. Um, that's a huge drop from Instagram to TikTok. And it's something which TikTok recognizes because they've got a very good uh, system where they pay creators to create content um, in the same way that YouTube is, is mostly you know, people who watch YouTube, not people who create things for YouTube. So there's a creator program on YouTube as well to encourage more people to make them by monetizing what they're able to do on that platform. But when you look at LinkedIn, it's actually about 1.5%, a really tiny amount. Now, about 6% of people have ever posted anything on LinkedIn, but only 1.5% of the, 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 the 8 to 900 million people who are on the platform are posting on a regular basis. That creates a little bit of an opportunity simply because those feeds are not that busy when you compare to the amount of people who are consuming the content on them. It's why uh, I guess TikTok is so addictive and so fun is because then you're able to, um, you know, you're able to go through and, and be part of you know, a place where there's a huge audience, but there's not a lot of competition for the feed. It may seem like it's busy, but there's a reason why TikTok throws so many weird and wonderful things at you and not just the things you follow is because there's not enough coming from the things you follow to keep that feed full. Uh, same thing on LinkedIn. LinkedIn will throw you a lot of stuff that they think is going to be very good for you and, and probably um, something you're going to be interested in. But when they do it is that they quite often will throw you things. It's like suggestions for things that are going to be a bit different. So when it comes to the places which are very busy, you've got Facebook, you've got Instagram, where they're very, very full of, of creators doing things and contributing to the feed. But when it comes to things like TikTok and LinkedIn, lots of audience, but not so many people producing stuff. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with a framework where you need to be able to create significant attention if you want people to, to see you, to, to become a bit more in, um, involved in what you're doing. And by creating significant attention, you have to create quality content. Secondly, you want to be able to then build trust in your expertise. So your your attention, uh, so your, your your social media posts are not really the thing that's going to build trust in your expertise. They're more of an introduction. They're very much a summary of your big stuff. So that building your trust in the expertise has to happen somewhere else. And we'll look at what that is soon. Then we'll look at deepening relationships. So taking people maybe off of those social media platforms and into conversations with you on things like email, chat programs, even on a phone call or an in-person meeting. But ultimately what you need is something at the end that's going to help you to create income. So the way that you take all this social media activity and turn it into something which is a little bit more than just a bit of interest and, and, a, and a bit of uh, eye candy and becomes something which actually makes you money. And we'll look at some of the options for that too. Just bear in mind though, that this is very much not about retailers or people who are selling individual products. This is definitely more about people who are solopreneurs uh, who, who sell services rather than selling products. So you tend to be the service. So first of all, we'll look at creating significant attention and what that actually means and how you can achieve that. It sounds very broad and very, very nice, but it comes from better content. Better content creates attention. Now we might find that that's hard to believe on Facebook where we've been going around for years and years and years creating content, but we've had absolutely no momentum, probably because content that businesses create is pretty boring. It's not particularly compelling for anybody but ourselves. Um, we also need to have a bit of a strategy when we create that better content. And we have to take a little bit of time because it does take time and a lot of consistency to do this. Like I said earlier, it took me six months to get that, that momentum enough that now I'm regularly having leads dropping in you know, on every couple of days. And, I, and I'm someone who can only take on a very small amount of clients at any one time, but I do have other programs where I can filter people through and be able to serve them better there too. So in my case, I don't need a million followers because I don't really want a million new customers. I can't serve them. I don't have the infrastructure and I don't want the empire to have to be able to handle that. I just want to be able to work with the people I want from wherever I want, whenever I want. Now, the better content is based upon the idea that it's content that creates value. Now, what does that mean? Well, creating value is helping people for free with no strings attached. 
you answer questions, you might build tools, you might share your expertise. And the idea is that even though you're giving away all this value very early on, eventually people will ask you for more. Now I have to put a, a bit of a, um, a, a, a preface in there. Not everybody is going to be your customer. And likewise, not everybody is going to come down through the bottom of this little creator funnel to be your customer. Most people and the vast majority of them will get the, the information they need um, and they'll move on. Um, there, there's, there's a, in, in our circles of, of being uh, live streamers and uh, webinar makers, we know that there are a lot of people who we call workshop junkies. And workshop junkies will be people who basically hop from workshop and webinar to webinar and workshop. Uh, they never really apply anything, uh, but they really get, you know, they get a lot of motivation and they really seem to enjoy the process of going through learning. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The problem is that those people never really execute and then they'll never therefore, you know, execute with you. So don't worry that you're giving away a lot of stuff for free for people who will never pay you. That's the whole point because what happens is they were never going to pay you in the first place. They're workshop junkies. They, um, they love watching a lot of YouTube videos. They, they, they are self-learners and they are self-executing. They're never going to work with you to do that. And that's okay because what you're doing is creating a bank of content that enough people are seeing that when the right person does see that, they see some sort of credibility from your content. So better content creates a lot of value and you need to distribute it in those places where people are already consuming content. I spoke before about TikTok and LinkedIn as being a place where you can get so much more attention so much more easily than what you can from say Facebook or Instagram, which are already very, very busy with lots and lots of stuff coming down their streams. I did a meme a couple of weeks ago on, on Facebook, which was indicating that if Facebook has, you know, the biggest amount of people on it, why, do, why does my content not get seen? And that's because it's not just that there's a lot of people, but there's a lot of content as well, way more than what's coming down on things like TikTok or, or LinkedIn. But the other ones that you may have to look at is maybe YouTube. I'm, I'm live streaming on YouTube today as well as Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, they're, LinkedIn and Twitter and, 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 and YouTube and Twitter particularly are uh, places where there's not a lot of competition for content, particularly rich media content such as live streams, videos, uh, a lot of photographic content. Um, YouTube is very much a place where people, they don't even know you can live stream on YouTube. But of course you can. Live streaming didn't just start and stop with Facebook Live. It's available even on TikTok these days. This particular platform I'm using is going out to multiple channels at the same time. So you need to go where people are already consuming it. I thought, oh yeah, I'll just do Facebook Live. But the reality is most of my following is on LinkedIn. Oh, I'll do LinkedIn Live then. Oh, but what about you know the potential to reach new audiences on other platforms? You know, I've got you know set like quite a few followers now on YouTube, but barely any on Twitter. So maybe. I if I do things like regularly on Twitter, I'll grow an audience there as well. Your better content is also going to be about the expertise or the information you can offer. So what do you know lots about? What are you generally known for to be someone who knows more about this topic than anyone else? That's the stuff you're going to talk about. In my case, content creation, personal brand, social media are my areas of expertise. I've been in them a long time. I've got a lot of accreditation in them and I've got a lot of reputation around those things as well. Um, and these things don't care about where you are. Like I'm in Darwin of all places. So for me, that's just saying, well, if I can do it from Darwin, you can do it from anywhere. I was working and doing live streams from Bali last week on a holiday and you know, sometime, you know, at, at the end of this year, I'll be working remotely from my, um, <clears throat> from, from my parents' house in, in the Gold Coast. So it's all very, very different um, when you're able to get that better content coming from anywhere where you happen to be. Now, my, me personally, I chose the niche down to talking pretty much entirely about social media and personal branding. So better content also has to come down from you might know 20 different uh, areas. You might be very, very good at all 20 of those areas. But the reality is you can only talk to a couple of them well and with great expertise and with great knowledge and with a good reputation as well. I know lots about WordPress, for instance. I can build websites. But I decided that the two things that I was best known for was social media and personal branding because of my work on LinkedIn. And of course, of course, my association with Meta or Facebook has 
has made me very much someone who can talk about those things. So I will talk about things that are on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. I'll talk about Twitter. I'll talk about YouTube and Facebook and, and every platform, including Be Real, which has just prompted me in the last few minutes to take my uh, to take my selfie of the day. So what Be Real is, it's nothing to worry about right now. It's pretty much not going anywhere. But for me, it's just an interesting app that I use to capture the day. Now, better content also comes from a strategy. You need to have a strategic approach. And that's what we're really you know, nailing down today is what this strategy happens to be. Your adding value will come in these four different formats. Now, this is a really good screen to screenshot if you need to. Because this is important information. These four kinds of content are the kinds of content you need to concentrate on. First one being is that someone feels like that you're teaching them. So you're teaching people something. That's the first piece of content. The second piece of content is that something that comes in the form of entertainment. So if you're talking about TikTok and sometimes YouTube, um, they're very much about entertainment. They're about people who get our attention, keep our attention, make us laugh, let us follow along for the drama of it all. But in general, it's about entertaining content. So we've got teaching content and entertaining content. And then there's sometimes content that just makes you think. It just makes you feel like, oh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like the right thing here is to, to, to listen to this person because they, they are thought-provoking. So that would be people like Simon Sinek. He's not entertaining. He's not funny. Um, he doesn't necessarily teach, but he's very thought-provoking. And the other form is that this person understands me. You're talking about something which that person needs right here, right now, and they didn't really have any sort of way to, to get that otherwise. And you've come in at a very unique place at a unique time. And the person listening to you, they feel like you just get them. You get them. You understand them. And that's a really important connection. So when you're adding value, it's in teaching, entertaining, being thought-provoking, or showing something that you get where they're coming from. Now, the get where they're coming from, the, the this person understands me area is probably the smallest of these because it's usually a very niche amount of people who may get value from that content. For instance, today, um, I can't see on this particular platform just how many people are viewing what we're viewing, but I can tell you now that this is, um, and I can't see actually the, the chat window. So my apologies if I, if I can't see people chatting during this on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or YouTube. Um, I can't see those pieces of feedback, but if I do see them once I get off here, I will answer all your questions after this live stream. Your strategy needs to be something which um, comes from the, the, the type of questions you're going to ask. And the questions we're going to ask is five of them. We're going to talk about those a little bit later, that they're great. They're going to give you endless content. Now, building trust in your expertise does not come from social media posts. It comes from something deeper. And that's what I call hub content. So you're building trust in your expertise comes from longer form content that says to someone, and sorry for the messed up screen there, but I recognize this person and I trust this person. Why would they recognize and trust you? Because you are showing them in this longer format content. So blogs, live streams, webinars, um, it could be videos on YouTube. It could be um, white papers. It could be a book. I'm in the middle of writing a book at the moment. I was in Bali up until uh, last night and I guess got back into Darwin last overnight last night. And I, I was writing a book. I've written about half of it now. So those sort of things, books do create a bit of trust because they are long format content that shows a depth of expertise. So that's something you have to really look at. So great ways to build that trust is through things like newsletters. My biggest source of new leads every single week is from my newsletter that now goes out to nearly 10,000 people every Saturday morning. Now, building that momentum comes from a lot of work. It's, it's taken me the whole year to build that up. Um, I've been regular and weekly on that for now 27 weeks. And that really makes a difference because people are used to seeing that now on a Saturday on their in their inboxes. And they tell me by responding to that email that they are getting value out of it and they ask questions about it. Not everyone. I might get about 15 or 16, maybe 20 at most responses to that. But those people are very interested in what I've said in that email and they're looking for more information or wanting to engage further. Again, they have, that trust has come that they now actually want to engage with me, whether it's a quick question, a, a booking through one of my government programs, or at a full fee um, consultation. They are still engaging with me where they wouldn't normally do that through social media. How-to content, particularly on things like YouTube or on a blog, um, where you're actually explaining how to do certain things that your audience wants to be able to do. 
also very valuable. Um, live streams, webinars are great ways to build that trust. There's a very big reason why I'm doing this live stream here today is because it provides a deeper look at a topic where I often, you know, may have a couple of lines to say about it in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on LinkedIn or in Facebook or on Twitter, but Right here, this is where we go into a lot more depth and it creates a lot deeper trust because I'm now showing you that I know what I'm talking about. I'm not just you know, blabbering out a line or two on social media. The goal of this longer term content really is to show people that you have deep knowledge about the topic. You know enough about the topic to be trusted and hey, let's take this off the socials and chat about it offline. And that's always a really, that, that's ultimately what you're trying to do is be able to get attention on social media, then take them off to somewhere like a blog, to a, to a, um, a YouTube video, to a webinar, where you can create a more of a, a deeper trust in what it is that you happen to know. And if that's something that someone goes, yes, I want to be able to work with you on that, then they'll take that off social media. They'll message you on a private message. They'll send you through an email, anything like that, to be able to connect with you on other social media platforms to try and get that time with you. Because ultimately what you're selling is your time and access to yourself. So deeper trust does come from um, places where you own your audience. So it will be through an email newsletter or a, a website or through something which is not a social media platform. You don't own your presence fully on LinkedIn. So you don't want to have to be subs you don't want to have to be um, uh, limited by algorithms. Algorithms will limit your reach to people. So if you don't get them off there into a place where you have a little bit more control, um, particularly your own website, but secondarily in your email list, um, then you may not reach that person again because their reach is very, very fickle. Even on great reach platforms like LinkedIn and uh, TikTok, I'll find that I'm really only on LinkedIn reaching at any one time, perhaps um, at, at the most, I'll be reaching the people that I'm connected to and then a few more, but I'm not reaching you know, every single person that's ever had an engagement with me. I don't know that the person who showed an interest in me last time on a post is seeing me again. I want to get them off LinkedIn so I can control the, the flow of that, uh, that, that content and that contact with them. Then when we go to look at deepening the relationship, this is where we go and take them offline. We have a chat with them. We have all sorts of ways of doing that. Deeper relationships are all about access to you. Now, a lot of people who want to do the 10X thing, the Grant Cardone thing, they want to expand and sell courses, they want to do the Andrew Tate thing, God help us all, um, then they, they're all, they, they will understand that there's only so many hours you have in the day. So you have to do one or two things. You have to charge a premium for your time. Or you have to scale out to a lot more people. I'm not talking about scaling out at this stage. I'm assuming that if you're on this particular live stream and this particular video, you are not at the scaling out and scaling up stage. You are very much at the I need to get started stage. So these deep relationships are about access to you and your time. They take place in meetings and seminars where people can actually see you face-to-face -face in training sessions and workshops. This can take place uh, in Facebook groups. I think they're a great place to be able to, to deepen those relationships where you can invite people to participate in your Facebook group and they can ask questions directly to you where you don't have to connect as a friend to everybody in the world on Facebook or LinkedIn, but you can invite them into your private groups on Facebook where you can have a little bit more time with them, whether that's paid, which groups can be paid on Facebook these days, or whether it's just free access to an open group where there's people who follow you get better access to you rather than through a Facebook page or a Facebook profile. In-person meetings. Um, there's something about, you know, shaking hands with someone or at least sitting down face to face with someone where you can do that in the town you're in. Now, naturally, that's going to be a little harder to do um, where you have to, uh, where, you, where you're working with people who don't live in your same town or may live, you know, on the other side of your city. So it's not, you know, you might be based in Frankston in Melbourne, but, you know, you're not really going to have an in-person meeting easily with someone from Werribee. It's going to take a while for you to be able to get to each other. And, and then there's the traffic and, and the commuting that has to take place. Sometimes that's going to be a Zoom call. And these deeper relationships, they also take place through things like Zoom calls and Teams calls. And, and Google Meet calls and whatever calls you're using, they still deepen that relationship. I, the, other, the other one I like to have is the coffee. Um, you know, there's a bit of a problem though with the, with the let me pick your brain coffee. Uh, you know, get those ones where people just say, hey, hey, I want to tell you about the coffee. I want to pick your brain over something. 
just be aware about that. Yes, it does deepen the relationships. And if you want to invest in a relationship with that person who you think may be um, a, a great customer one day, well, by all means, have that coffee. But just do be aware that um, I look at I look at the coffee meetings as as this: someone is buying me a six dollar coffee to access two hundred and fifty dollars worth of my time. That's not really a good return on the investment. Now, we all need to go out for lunch. We all need to eat. We all need to drink coffee, apparently. I drink tea myself. I have a very nice masala tea that I'm drink, uh, drinking right now. But the, the that, that one hour you spend with someone where they're spending only $6 to see you, that's taking away the potential for you to earn whatever your regularly hour, hourly rate is. And this is something I really only wake, woke up to this year. Um, I get tons and tons of requests to, for my time, as a lot of you will. The problem is, though, people don't necessarily want to pay for that time. They just think that because you're a nice guy or a nice girl that you're going to give that advice for free. You're doing it because you think there might be a potential customer in this. Um, they were probably never really going to be your customer. So what I'd like to do is if someone say, hey, can we grab a coffee? I generally say, well, I'm actually booked out for the next two weeks, which is true. Um, I'm booked out for the next two weeks and I can't do a coffee meeting before then. But hey, if there's something I can answer right here, right now, let me know. And usually what they'll do, they'll ask this one question that you can generally answer on a message over messenger. You don't necessarily need to take, you know, the, the hour and a half out of your time, you know, let's say 15 minutes to get there, 15 minutes to get back and an hour of sitting in a cafe. I love to socialize as much as anyone. I love a coffee. I love to meet people. I really enjoy it. The only problem is that that hour usually costs $250 for me. So in my case, I'm losing $250 for the sake of a $6 coffee. They might be nice enough to buy me a bit of lunch too, but think about it. Lunch is going to be no more than about $25. That's only 10% of what my alley fee happens to be. When we deepen the relationship, we understand how someone thinks. So that your client is going to understand a bit about how you tick, how you work, um, you know, how you act. Sometimes you meet someone in person and they are completely not how you think they are on social media. They're not as friendly. They're not as open. They're not as approachable. And they really just, they're not great. And you think, oh God, I'm glad I actually took the time to get to know this now because I don't want to work with this person. I've got a couple of rules in my life and, and it comes to dating and even you know, meeting with clients. I watch how people treat people who work in hospitality. I watch very closely how people work with people in hospitality and with people, say, in, in air, airport lines and things like that and, and security guards. The way that people talk to people like that, the way they interact with people like that, tells me a lot about the kind of person they are. If they can't treat a waiter or a barista or a person at a checkout at Coles or Woolies or a security guard outside a venue, if they can't treat those people respect it, with respect and dignity and in a very good way, then they're not going to treat me in a very good way either because at some point they will see me as their, as their servant and they'll start treating me badly as well. So that's a very big sign of when you're deepening that relationship to make sure you observe of how that person reacts to people who are serving them right now. People want to deepen the relationship because they want to know that they are liked and that they're on the right track. They want some reassurance. They, they want to be able to grow their knowledge. They want to be able to see whether you've got something in common because I don't know if, I, if I'm going to spend three and a half thousand dollars on a coach, I want to know that we've got some stuff in common. We've got something, some way that we can connect with each other really well. Sometimes people want to deepen the relationship because you might be in their world, you're a bit of a star. Like you're, you're, this, you're this, this, this chick on social media who is just doing all these amazing things they wish they could do. So they want to deepen that relationship because they feel like being around you will help them be more like you. And that's not a bad thing at all. In fact, um, that's something which can be you know turned into a coaching career of your own. If people want to be like you, you can teach them to become like you. And finally, what we want to do is create the income. And creating the income comes from having a plan from the very beginning of how you're going to monetize and how you can have make money out of all this stuff you're doing. None of us should be on social media just for the sake of being on social media. None of us should be on social media just for the sake of, you know, getting a bit of attention. Unless that's your thing, and that's completely fine if it is, the reality for a business person on social media is you want to be able to have some kind of background agenda. Now, I know agendas sound really bad and, and, and no one wants to have an agenda, but the reality is of having an agenda is that you're going to be someone who I guess then has the, you have a, a direction 
you have a strategy, you have a way forward. And that's ultimately what you want to do. You want to have a way forward. You want to have somewhere for people to go, which somehow will end up being a value and of some kind of advantage to yourself. Having nowhere to go means you're rudderless. You're, you're rudderless on a sea where you have no control of where you're going. You're just going with the flow. And as I like to say to people, like, I, I, lo I love go with the flow kind of people, but you know what else goes with the flow? The stuff you flush down the toilet that goes through the sewer, that also goes with the flow. So I don't want to be the stuff that goes down the sewer pipe. I want to be the person who has direction and I want to be the person who has some kind of plan for what I'm doing. So how do we create that income? What are the options that we can do for there? Remembering we're not talking about retail sales. We're talking about monetization. And it's a lot easier at this level where you've got that relationship with people, where you've had some kind of deeper contact with them, a deeper relationship, because there's an increased level of trust. There's a hierarchy and a process that comes when people are buying new things. It doesn't matter whether it's peanut butter at the supermarket or whether it's a coaching service worth thousands of dollars. When you have that increased level of trust, people are much more likely to, 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 to trust you. They're much more likely to, to, what we want people to do basically is get to know you through social media and get to like you maybe through social media. And then eventually they'll trust you enough through your deeper content that you've led them through to that they'll actually buy your time or buy whatever your product or service happens to be. This is particularly helpful for big ticket things, things that are going to cost quite a lot of money. The other thing too, that monetization is easier at this level of trust because you've got now a captive audience. This person, you have their attention. They now know you, they like you. And to a degree at this level, they also trust you enough to hear more of what you've got to say. So that captive audience is a lot easier to then introduce something that helps you to get paid. It's also a more private setting. So people are much more likely to open up. Um, you're going to open up a lot more too. I think a degree of vulnerability is really helpful with people. I think it's a much better way for people to operate because we know where people stand and where they're coming from. And there's also no algorithm to block you out. There's no algorithms who are going to block you from having a coffee at a coffee shop. There's no algorithm that's going to block you from, um, I would have said see your email, but yeah, I guess that, you know email spam filters sometimes get in the way of those. Um, but generally a direct email address, a direct phone number, a direct Skype or Zoom or, or Teams call, anything like that is going to be something you can do at this level of trust. No algorithms to get in the way of that relationship. So what can you do that makes income then? You can do things like consultations, paid workshops, systems, online courses, anything that's going to sort of create something which you can sell on a mass level. Um, how I work on this is I've got some certain services I provide for free um, that are free for them, but I get paid for through the government, um, the government uh, programs that I'm part of. I also sell premium one-to-one -one consultations. Uh, it starts at $250 and then goes down. Now, $250 for an hour seems like a lot, right? But the majority majority of people who I see of that $250 an hour level are paying me to basically save themselves 20 hours of time. So they're not in grasping for straws, trying to learn these things through a myriad of different opinions and people who they don't know to trust. They can just pay me and skip forward uh, quite a few steps. So $250 to save you weeks of work and research, that's a pretty good investment. Corporate workshops. I sell um, uh, training like this to, to corporate groups. Um, I, I custom make all that training for them as well to make sure it suits their particular industry. And I have a small interview with them at the beginning to see what their outcomes are and the kind of people and what they expect to get out of that training. Also have a, a degree of done for you services, things like website design, landing page building, um, running and setting up you know, Facebook ads ads campaigns and, and helping to create different um, lots of content for people's social media. So I've got a, a funnel of different things that I can create for people that helps me to create the income. So to put it sort of a bit more, um, you know, graphically, I've got this attention grabbing content that I'm producing on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, YouTube, and, and Twitter to a small degree that then points to my deeper properties, the places where I have more content. So think places like YouTube, uh, Medium, which is like a, like an online newspaper, uh, my website, my newsletter, or even places where I can chat to people. So I can take that attention grabbing content and make it go somewhere. You'll notice just, just about all the posts that I place on social media these days have somewhere for you to go next. If it's in the comments or at the bottom of the post, it's somewhere I say, hey, I wrote more about this here, or hey, I did a workshop recently more about this, or hey, I'm doing a work shop soon that you may want to sign up for. 
Um, my funnel works for that that free for them, paid for me. So I work with two government programs, Digital Solutions and Self Employment Services, which helps people to start businesses. And the, and the Digital Solutions is a subsidized program of like forty four dollars for three one hour sessions with me. That um, it's much much less than what two hundred and fifty times three is seven hundred and fifty dollars. $44 is a much easier way to get that time with me. The offside of that is, though, because you have to wait a few weeks before you'll get an appointment with me. Um, monetizing comes then from uh, meetings where, where people are paid for my time to meet with me. Uh, those paid workshops there also is paid courses that I might have there. I haven't started the paid courses yet. I'm still writing those, but this also soon I'll have a book that I'm selling. So, you know, for, for 10 bucks, you can download a book, which um, is, it condenses so much of the stuff that I teach and the things I've learned along the way. So there's always going to be something where I can lead to that eventually people can buy. They can buy my time. They can buy my, my product. Now we get to this strategic content part now. This is where we're going to really nail down how we are going to do this better content on social media. And this is what I call hub and spoke content. I've lifted this stuff straight from a guy called Justin Welsh. Um, he's one of the, the best content creators on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, yeah tens of well, hundreds of thousands of followers um he just he just nails it every time there's not a bad post he makes pretty much right i've got him on notifications and there's only really one new post that will come up within a time frame that i'm not asleep because in american um, i'm definitely not american so i'm on a very different time zone within 60 seconds of him posting something, he will already have about 109, 110 comments within 60 seconds. This is the kind of popularity the guy has. He has such a strong following. But this is his idea, the hub and spoke content. So I'm lifting it straight from him with a few little quirks of my own. The hub and spoke, there's like a wheel. You've got the hub in the center, which is your deeper long form content. That's your blogs, your YouTube videos, your webinars, your, your live streams. And then out along the wheel, is the spokes that are going out there. And that's your shallower, shorter format content. That's the stuff where you're sort of maybe teasing a bit, you're, you're, you're dropping a little bit of a truth bomb, you may be uh, quite entertaining, but it all has to lead somehow to that deeper, long-form content. So as we saw before, your deeper, long-form content is going to show a lot more expertise in a particular topic that you're teaching. It's also going to show a depth of knowledge. It's going to inspire a deeper relationship. Remember, we're talking about that content funnel. As people get to know you, they get to like you, they get to trust you, they want to know more. And this deeper long form content also pays off on someone's curiosity. You're creating sort of a curiosity when you're first starting on, on, a, on a social media post. The next step down is the payoff to that. If you click on the link, you'll find out more about you know, this particular topic that I'm talking about. And they go to that link and they get the payoff. They see that curiosity being paid off. It's a very powerful thing that people can do. That deeper long form content, and as I said before, is often in the form of blog posts. I run at least one of those a week. Um, YouTube videos. Um, I don't always do a lot of those, but this particular live stream is going out to YouTube, which becomes part of my YouTube vi a video collection. Webinars are a very good way of doing this. They're great because they tend to be one-way broadcasts or they can even be automated. I bought a bit of software earlier this year that I haven't used yet, which allows me to record and then distribute webinars um, at, at a very, very low cost because I basically bought a system that will just do it for a lifetime for free now. And it just basically, you know, when you go to look at those webinars, you select the time and like, oh, there's one starting in 15 minutes, that kind of thing. And um, I don't really quite that, that um, you know, I don't want my webinars to be like high pressure sales funnels to get people to spend $600 on my, on my, on my course, nothing like that. But what I want to do is at least have something which I can make use of, do it once and make use of it. So it frees up my time. So I'm not doing so many of these live things all the time. I can do things which are simulated live newsletters, email newsletters are the great underappreciated and under, oh, it's just an area where I've had so much success with um, based upon so little effort. Um, like immediately I have to write you know, a, a long email every week, but you know, I do that daily to, to people that I need to send detailed information to. So I think a newsletter is it's the great underappreciated hero of digital marketing um, because you're sending stuff to people who already know you. They're already on your list because they know you. Podcasts are great. I do a weekly podcast and I've got, what, 220 something, something like 220 or so um, episodes of that. That's been going for a few years now. It's something which takes so little effort because I'll, I'll show you a little secret. 
my podcast is just my blog post read out loud. Um, but I read it out loud in such a way that it doesn't sound like I'm reading it out from, from a script. So it's been something which I do so very little effort on. The podcast production to record it and to put it up there takes about 15 to 20 minutes once a week. And that has been paying off so much in terms of my credibility and the ability to reach more people. Because there's, what, 300 bil- 3 billion blogs out there and there's about 3 hundred billion blog posts going out every single week. Whereas in podcasting, it's only about three to four million podcasts. And so, but there's a huge audience for them. Ebooks are another thing too, but it doesn't have to be a full length, you know, Amazon Kindle, um, you know, Epic War and Peace novel. It can just be a 10 page ebook that people can download as part of what your lead magnet may be. Something which is um, that you they give away for free as a way to deepening that relationship with you. So what you want to do with the short form content then, this is your social media posts, you need to get attention very quickly because attention is very, very short on social media. In that attention, you then inspire a bit of curiosity. They go, oh, that's interesting. Let me read more. And that's where you introduce your expertise and make a new connection. So these are the things that you do very, very early in the process of connecting with someone new. You're getting attention to to get them to look at you. Once they look at you, you want to then inspire the curiosity to keep reading or keep watching that video or go to somewhere, click on that link, which then introduces your deeper expertise in something. And that helps you to make that new connection, which that new connection is going to be how you can then you know, develop that no like trust relationship. They, they, they know you, they begin to like you, then they trust you enough to be really hearing what you've got to say and what you've got to sell. Your shallow thought form content can be short form video. So your TikToks, your Instagram reels kind of stuff. Infographics um, are still quite interesting. I, I still stop and look at those. I'm going to see a lot of them on Pinterest. In fact, that's mostly what I do on Pinterest is looking for infographics to give me you know, uh, graphical ways of, of expressing really cool information. Um, long text posts or short text posts, like very, very quick, short, sharp, clever things. Um, Justin Welsh is very good at those. In fact, that's, that's the majority of what he does. Very rarely posts any sort of video or, or, or graphics. It's just about all short text posts with a bit of a truth bomb makes you curious enough to go, oh, I want to know more about this guy. Um, it could be sharing, sharing stories. So, um, you know, the interactive stories on Facebook stories, uh, Instagram stories. Um, stories are also what we call shorts, um, you know, reels, that kind of thing. Photos can be really good at sharing short format content. Justin shared one last week of his backyard. It was a forest. Um, which was amazing. So it just looked at, he was just showing that this is the lifestyle I have because I've now been able to have a system that allows me to be able to make, you know, nearly $3 million of revenue um, by working on my own. Um, There's the shared content. So you can share other people's stuff. So you find something inspirational. You find something really interesting. I do that a lot on, on Twitter. Um, my Twitter is not very much like my other feeds. My Twitter is a lot of it's shared content from other people where I've retweeted great ideas that other people have. So when you go to create the long form content, in my case, my hub content, my Saturday morning newsletter now has nearly 10,000 subscribers through, um, through email, through, um, through the newsletter feature on uh, LinkedIn plus Medium as well. So nearly 10,000 people um, wake up to my morning newsletter on Saturday morning. My YouTube channel, I've got about 200 plus videos on there. My podcast, as I said, has got about 220 episodes now. And I've got a blog of free guides, which is around about, that's, that's approaching 200. Um, articles now too. So I've got a lot of that content I've been building up over the last couple of years. Now, if you're worried and going, oh my God, where do I get all this from? This is going to take me forever. Yes, it's taken me a couple of years. Start with one thing. Start with a blog if you're a good writer. Start with podcasting if you like to talk. Start with a channel of YouTube content or TikTok. Start with something that you feel comfortable doing. Not everyone's comfortable writing, so then make video. Not comfortable with video, do some podcasting. If you're not comfortable with either of them, write a a, a regular newsletter every week or every month that gives you something that has deeper information that you can share with people. This stuff doesn't have to take a lot of time. You don't need to have all the content that I've got, for instance. You just start with one piece of hub content. Choose one and make it the easier type for you. And then there's a bit of a hierarchy here on what's easiest and what's hardest. I'd say that when it comes to technical expertise, blog posts are the easiest thing because you've probably already got a website that does that. Newsletters it can be done through things like MailChimp or the system I use called Send in Blue. Send in Blue is way better than MailChimp. And for me, it just handles like so many more people for such a lower cost. 
ebooks are the next level of difficulty. Webinars, a little bit more like these live streams, require a third party system. I'm using a thing called Restream, which allows me to go to multiple live streams. YouTube is a great place, but it does need some expertise from you on how to record yourself and edit your video. Podcasts, I think, are the, probably the, the hardest thing to do technically, but they're not that hard. I use a thing called Audio Boom, which um, it distributes all my stuff. There's others called Libsyn, podcast.co. There's tons of platforms that will allow you to send your podcasts out and, and syndicate them through to places like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, um, one of the big ones, the Stitcher that comes through as well. Um, and then TuneIn is another area where I got a lot of people coming through Google Podcasts, which is the one I happen to use as well. So there's um, th th there's a bit of technical setup there, but it's not huge. Uh, these systems do most of that for you. So you've just got to identify what the easiest kind of hub content it is for you to create. So then you've got that done. So for blog posts, here's a, here's a really, really good, um, I guess, structure for a blog post. Ask a question in a title. Answer that question in the first paragraph with three dot points that you're going to explain on later. Then what you do, once you've got those three dot points, they become your three main sections of your content. So you expand on those three dot points, which you're using to back up your answer to the question. And then you conclude with how you would use this information and then following that the next steps towards working with you, or maybe going off to see some other stuff that you've done. For instance, if I was asking a question in a title of my blog, which is um, how to create better social media content, I'd answer that by saying the creating better social media content is making use of the tools that the different systems want you to use. Things like groups, things like um, like video, like live video and live streams. Now, and then what I'd do is I'd explain each one of those areas where you could make better content through live streaming, better content through through blogs, better content through video. And then I conclude with you might want to use this information um, perhaps to increase vi visibility of a business. You might want to increase uh, the the credibility of your services. And then if you'd like to know more about it here are my contact details and here's another youtube video that better explains what this might be for you so you always want to lead people to somewhere else at the end of a blog post newsletters get to the point honestly i only cover one idea per newsletter i have links to stuff down the bottom of the newsletter at the very end where people can then go and book a 15 minute call with me they can go and book in for my next workshop they can read a blog that i've written previously i've only got three only three links i've got at the bottom and i have it as a ps ps um when you're ready um here's three ways i can help you out and then i just put those little things people will click on them people will not click on them Generally, the click-through rate's around about 10%. So 10% of the people who open my email will then go forward and click on a link to go somewhere else. Um, not all of those are going to be people who book me for my discovery calls, but that's okay. I can't handle that many discovery calls. In fact, at the moment, the discovery call is about a three-week wait list. So I don't necessarily want... 10,000 people all booking me all at the same time because I'd be on uh, the wait list to be three years long. So you always end with how you can help, but do only cover one idea per newsletter. No one's interested in the CEO's thoughts. No one's interested in you know, how you're going with this program over here. No one's really interested in hearing your opinions on current social events and social affairs and, and current affairs. Um, just get to the point. Have one idea per newsletter. With the ebook, you don't need to have more than 10 pages. Um, just have one idea or one skill that you want to put across in there. You don't have to go. You know, one, one actually really good form that I've seen lately is 10 ideas to help you do better on social media. So each one of those pages represents one idea and it's not a whole page of text. It's generally quite a lot of graphics. So these eBooks are a way of condensing down complex information in simple ways that people can download and take with them. The idea would be that they have to, to get that information, submit their email address and subscribe to your newsletter in order to get that in there. Um, link to a point or a place where they can learn more um, or they might want to inquire with you, to book time with you, to buy something from you. But um, inc always include in that eBook somewhere where they can go to get more.
that's the same with everything. It doesn't matter what you're doing. At the end of everything, give people somewhere to go. Um, and webinars, you can use Facebook Live like I've used here, or you can use you know, Twitter Spaces, which I've done, Instagram Live, YouTube Live, which I'm on right now, Facebook Live, which I'm on um, as well. Um, you can use Zoom, you can use Teams, you can use Meet. Um, in my case, I'm using Restream, which is um, allowing me to go out to multiple different places rather than going through a Zoom call. Uh, YouTube, make it at least 10 minutes long because that 10 minutes is that point where YouTube takes you a lot more seriously. And it's also the monetizable length of a video, which means you then qualify once you have enough followers uh, to be able to make money from your content on YouTube. It won't make much. You need millions of views to get really decent money. But it's nice to know that there's a bit of a guideline in place that helps you to, to be taken more seriously by them. You can add chapters through time stamping. So you put, you know, zero, zero dot, um, one seven, which is 17 seconds. This starts at 32 minutes and 56 seconds. This starts by doing that. You're, you're actually being very clear to YouTube and making it very easy for people to navigate your content. I don't like it when I go to a YouTube that promises one thing and it takes me 15 minutes before they actually get to that one thing that they promised. I like to have it chaptered out so I can skip to the bits that I actually need. So I can be much more efficient with my time. Be very clear in your title. Clever titles um, might be really good for getting people to click on you, but clear titles are what people are looking for specifically for the problem you solve or something that you're educating on. So use tags, use keywords um, to be able to attract those search on YouTube, remembering that YouTube is the second biggest search engine after Google. So make sure that you are searchable. There's SEO that comes in with YouTube that allows you to, to, to optimize how you'll be found by people. Um, one of my videos has got well over 15,000 views now, simply because it's optimized for one specific search that's very, very popular. And it's to do with setting up a Facebook shop podcasts you can do long ones you can do short ones you can do regular episodes like every day every week every month you can have a defined topic area um, my topic area is all about you know social media and, and personal branding you can be an interview style i get asked to be on interviews for podcasts all the time i get pitched people who want to be on my podcast but i've got a solo podcast it's just me um, i don't have guests so I chose a solo path because it takes less time. Having guests takes such much, such setup and you got to sort of vet people and make sure they're not just going to go and try and, you know, hijack your audience for their very own purposes uh, without adding any value to them. You also need a very clear audio. People will forgive some bad visuals, but they will not forgive bad audio. So having a good mic, I've got this Shure mic here. This one cost me about $400 at the time. I think it's come down a little bit in that, but it's a very good quality mic. And you'll notice that my voice quality should be fairly good coming through this today. Now, the short form content, which is the social media content, this is the one you've come here for, right? There's certain ways you can do this. There's the one or two liner, which is a very small statement. And we'll look at that. The problem agitate solution method, the problem agitate intrigue positive future solution. They're very, very bad names. I know. Sorry about that. The favorite one I've got is the, the way of writing that's throwing rocks at a common enemy. And then the five questions you get to ask which will generate almost endless content. So let's look at the one or two liner. The one or two liner basically is that um, you might, there's a point in a call to action. The point is almost everyone hates having to write their own website text. Luckily, there's people like me who love it. Drop me a message. This is the most basic kind of post you're going to do. And we can do it really well. It's quite effective, but most people don't do it well. They introduce a topic and then they immediately try to sell something. Social media is a terrible place to sell things because people are not on social media to be sold. They're on there to be entertained, to be connected to people, to find out what their family's doing, what their friends are doing. They're not there necessarily to buy things. So when you just go straight from the, here's my point now, buy, you're kind of, it's very jarring. Nobody really needs to see that. Well, no one wants to see that. But if you start with a, a bit of a, a point going, well, look, almost everyone hates having to write their own website text. Well, luckily there's people like me who love it. At least then you're not necessarily selling anything but the idea of dropping your message to ask more. Is this particularly effective? Can be. Very clever people can do this quite well. <clears throat> um, a, a more effective call to action is probably something motivational. So it'd be something like, if you're hating the nine to five and you really don't want to have to work in that corporate job anymore, there's things you can do. Text me to find out how. 
So it gives someone a bit of curiosity to say, well, how did you do it? How did you manage to pull this off? Why am I not being able to pull this off? I'm just going to pour myself a cup of tea here as we move on to the problem agitate solution model. This is uh, made famous by, I guess, the, the Madison Avenue men, the Mad Men, the, uh, the, the, the David Ogilvies, um, the, the great heroes of the 60s and 70s when it came to the advertising industry. It's where you introduce a problem, you then make that problem feel a little worse, and then you give a solution. So let's just say writing your own website copy is hard and takes a long time to do. Then we agitate that. Add to that, bad website copy can seriously affect your ability to be found on Google. The solution then comes into get me to do your writing so you can get back to doing the things that need to be done. So you're starting off with a problem. You agitate that solution a bit more and make it seem a lot worse. And then you introduce the solution just at the point where that person feels like they're, they're, there may be no hope for them to get this thing done properly. Is it manipulative? Yeah, a little bit, but it's not that bad. It's not that terrible. What you're really looking for, I guess, is that for people to say that, yes, it is hard. Yes, that definitely convinces me that I need to do something about it. And then they may be ready for that solution. Now, what you may do in the solution is not necessarily hit straight to the sale by saying, get me to do your writing. You might say getting a professional copywriter can make a very big difference. It allows you to save time so you can get back to doing what needs to be done. So you're not necessarily saying pick me, you're just saying pick the people who do the things that I do. There's, a, there's a, a really good reason why you should do that. The next one's got a couple of extra steps. Very, very similar. The problem, agitate, intrigue, positive future solution model or the paphos. Paphos? Yeah, that, that, that's just not going to come down to a very nice um, acronym. So the problem, again, writing your own website copy is hard, takes a long time to do. Let's make that worse by saying bad website copy can seriously affect your ability to be found on Google. Now let's intrigue them with a bit of curiosity. Recent advancements in AI mean that now the cost of copywriting services has dropped. Oh, there's a bit of a positive future in saying that this means you can look forward to a website build without the brain-breaking writing tasks. Get me and my AI assistant to do your writing so you can get back to doing what needs to be done. So this is a bit more of a storytelling model. It starts off with a problem. It makes that problem a little bit worse, introduces a little bit of curiosity, and then, then introduces the hope, the hope for a better future with the tool or the service or the product that you're providing. And the solution is go and start with this. Get me and my AI assistant to do your writing. My favorite one is this one, <laughs> the throwing rocks at a common enemy. The nine to five hustle is dying more each day. Flexible work arrangements are becoming normal. And I love this, everything about it. Why? Well, because the old way wasn't working anymore. Spending so much time away from family is no way to live. If you want to make it work for you, you need a strategy to stay on top of this new paradigm. Download my hybrid work playbook via the link below. So let's just pull that apart. The relatable enemy is something that you both that you have a solution for and that your customer may see as an enemy. In this case, a nine to five hustle that they're hating. Then what you do, you say that, look, we both have this same enemy, but it's okay. We're winning this war against them. Then we're going to pour on a bit more fuel by basically showing that you're on their side. So you, get, so you can see them going, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, flexible work. Yeah, I like the idea of that. And you're saying, I'm up for this too, and I love it. And they're going, yeah, yeah. And they start to get a bit of a fan base around you. Um, and then you explain, well, why that you love it so much? Because you agree with them. The old way isn't working anymore. And the call to arms is then going to someone, well, if you want to make it work for you, you need a strategy. And they're going, yeah, okay, show me the strategy. Show me the strategy. And then you give them that call to action, that next step, downloading a, a playbook via the link below. This one for me is the powerful one. This is what I do essentially. Every week, if you watch my content, particularly on LinkedIn, it follows this model. It creates me endless levels of content. It gives me a great diversity of content and it creates an expectation that at some point I'm going to create another article or another, another post just like the one you just read. Particularly um, people like to follow the contrarian article. So let's pull those apart a bit as we start to get to the very end of this. We want to ask what you can teach your audience about something that's in the context of your expertise when it comes to the teaching side of things. What can I teach my audience about something that is in the context of my expertise? So that's day one. Day two could be then, um, it'd be something like this. So teaching, like I'm telling you that you're being lied to by content creation gurus. I'm teaching you uh, something in this particular post about the nature of content creation gurus. Now, you don't need to read through all of that, but it's just an example, for instance. And you'll be able to watch this back on the replay on YouTube and Facebook as well. Secondly, 
what have I observed in my journey through my career or my business and life? What is something I've noticed? And in the example I'm going to give here, it's where I've noticed that there's cycles to social media. So having used social media since Friendster and MySpace, I've noticed these cycles. And I explained it. So I take that further and go, well, here's the cycles. Here's how each platform deals with these cycles. So it's a little bit educational, but it's an observation I've made. It shows that I'm pretty smart and I'm watching things and I'm, I'm noticing things. The next one is contrarian post. And this is a view that I have that runs pretty contrary to popular opinion. So it's a, you might call it an unpopular opinion. So in my case, it was all about not particularly liking Simon Sinek very much and unfollowing him and a bunch of other very, um, very well-known, very much loved and followed business influencers on LinkedIn. Um, now, it was, uh, it was unpopular in the fact that a lot of people like Simon Sinek, but I deliberately tried to capitalize on that by putting a photo of him and then a, a, um, a, a controversial statement, see you, Simon. Um, I actually do like Simon Sinek now. I've grown to actually appreciate his work, but at the time I just found him to be a Yoda that talks in riddles and I just didn't see any value. And that was the actual thing. I wasn't disrespecting these people. I was saying, I'm just not going to follow them anymore because I don't get a lot of value out of them. The next one is the listicle. And it's just basically a list of tools, tips, or processes that you can offer that are actionable. So you're making a list. So top threes, top tens, here's 21 reasons why, that kind of thing. So in this case, it was 21 idea prompts that were handy when you're short on time for making social media posts. So something that's within your area of expertise that you can list, that's something that people can make really, really easily use. The final one, and it's probably that this is more of a storytelling concept, is saying, why did this particular outcome occur? So you start with the outcome and say, this happened, here's how it happened, or here's why it happened. So in this case, I took one where you said, look, it's hard to accept this, but it's your fault if your social profile gets hacked. And then I go, how did the people, how did you get hacked? How did that hack happen? And I explain what it took for the people to be able to hack you. And the same thing is with the Medibank um, uh, hacking, which I've been caught up in because I'm, I'm with AHM, which is one of their health funds that was uh, attacked. Uh, Optus, people know very much about the Optus hack and, and how that occurred. So there's been lots of other ones, um, you know, with, with logistics companies and other companies, hotel chains have all been affected by this kind of thing. So what I do is I actually explain how that happens. I'm going to skip over the multimedia content now because what really what I want to do is try and take us to the point where we can look at, I guess, um, I want to look at the follow-up, how you take this further, how you can go to the next step and actually get some help with this kind of stuff. Because it's not always easy, I suppose, for someone to go, well, I want to be able to do all this stuff, but I don't understand where to get the help. I don't understand and where I'm going to find the help for this. And the help was largely going to come from things like um, people who you can work with, coaches. It's going to come from government programs, all that kind of thing. Now, I work on a couple of those things, um, a government program called Digital Solutions, uh, which you can get a hold of if you're in particular states of Australia. So that's um, Queensland, Western Australia, and the Northern Territory. We can certainly do that for you uh, through me. There's um, other programs that do that within New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania. But for um, the, the non-daylight saving states, as I call them, um, it's, it's all a bit different. So what is next that you can do that probably a little bit easier than that well the next thing you can do is is you can be part of one of my free online uh, mini courses that i've got now i've got a few of them but the one that's probably most interest to you is the one that actually covers all this so my website dantesandjames.com uh, you can go and click on the uh there we go the mini courses so where it says mini courses at the top in the menu and click on write better content. And that will be basically a five week step-by-step -step guide on how to do this better content. It's absolutely free. I'm not going to spam you afterwards. It's pretty much the course is over. It finishes. You can choose to sign up for a newsletter if you like, but you're under no obligation whatsoever. Absolutely free at dantesandjames.com and then click on the mini course called write better content. And you'll see it here. Just fill out your email address and I'll not spam you, I promise. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking some time out on this live stream. You can reach out to me through these various places. I probably suggest LinkedIn is the best place to go because it's where I spend most of my time, really. Facebook, yeah, too, and Instagram, I'm always on them. But um, LinkedIn's particularly um, popular for me because that's where I seem to connect with the most people who I need to connect with. So thank you once again for taking some time out. My name is Dante St. James. I really appreciate you taking time to, uh, to work on your business, not just in your business. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next live stream soon.